Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. And on Digging for Truth, we mainly focus our discussions on archaeological discoveries from the ancient Near East and their relationship to the Bible. Over and over again, we found that the Bible's presentation of people, places, and events are verified or better understood with archaeological discoveries. You might say that archaeology is pretty awesome. In fact, we would say it's epic. And it's so epic that we have a friend joining us today, Ted Wright, who is the founder of Epic Archaeology. And here's, he's here today to talk to us about his ministry and about the wonderful world of biblical archaeology. Ted, welcome to Digging for Truth. Henry, it's a, such an honor to be on with you guys. Yes, yeah, thank great. you for having me on. Yeah, well, uh, it's, great. it's great to see you. And you've been a friend of our ministry for quite a few years as an associate. Uh, and you have a, a, a ministry that you do, your passion for defending the faith and, and uh, using archaeology and to show the reliability of Scripture. You founded your own ministry called Epic Archaeology. What a great name, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. And so yes, I, 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 I agree. <laughs> uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you just uh, tell the audience a little bit about, you know, uh, why you founded Epic Archaeology, why you think it's important, and let you share with them... Uh, uh, a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Henry, and thank you again for having me on uh, Digging for Truth. Um, as you know, uh, archaeology is is really an important part of apologetics, and uh, the reason why I found it, it's actually several reasons why I wanted to start Epic Archaeology. Uh, uh, some of it goes back to when I was an undergraduate student in archaeology. Um, many years ago, when uh, I decided to get my degree in archaeology as an undergrad, I, I took some classes at a secular college, and my degree is in anthropology. And one of the cl several of the classes that I took were on Near Eastern archaeology, and my professors would tell us stories that basically that essentially the Bible is not true. That you know it has a lot of great stories in it, but there's really no historical reliability for it. And uh, I, as a Christian, I sort of had a problem with that, and I did, but I didn't know how to really find any answers. So I ended up going to our uh, school library, and I found a book actually by Josh McDowell, uh, who, as you and I know, is a very famous Christian uh, apologist and defender of the Christian faith. And in one of the chapters of McDowell's books, he, he was quoting uh, some guys like uh, William F. Albright, uh, Nelson Glick, um, Edwin Yamauchi, and I didn't know who any of these guys are, and, and I know you know who they are, Henry, uh, but these are, these are men who defend the faith, uh, but defend the Bible actually through history and archaeology. So that led me down a path of uh, finding answers to see if there's any historical truth to these stories of the Bible, because for me, it did make a difference if these stories actually happened. Um, I wanted them to be true, but obviously I'm not going to believe they're, they're true if there's no historical or archaeological evidence for them. So yes. that's kind of why I, I wanted to start a ministry to to help give other people who may have uh, similar questions about the Bible, whether or not they're true. So so instead of uh, going into the library, we actually have a website. We have resources that people can go to see that, yes, there actually is much historical and archaeological evidence that the stories in the Bible are actually true. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's great, you know, and people who've watched our show be, before know that we're very like-minded on this. Um, yes. But still, you know, it's something that we, we talk about over and over again because there are so many discoveries and there are people out there like yourself going away to college at that time when you went to school, uh, running into this secular worldview that has a particular view of the Bible and don't know how to answer the questions. And so I think what I hear is partly is, you saying that, A, the gospel in its full story throughout the Bible has happened in history, and B, we want to equip people with answers so that, you know, they can stay strong through the storm of skepticism. That's right. That's exactly right, Henry. There's another component to it as well, and, and I actually chose the word epic. It's a great word, but but I also chose it because um, there's another dimension to, to this, and that is that... Um, the story in the Bible, really the crux of the, the biblical story is Jesus, and it, and all the Old Testament and all the New Testament, all of it points to Christ, and really the resurrection is the crowning jewel of the Christian faith. And as Paul says, as you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Christ has not been risen from the dead, then we are still dead in our transgressions and our sins. So, uh, so really, 
what I like to think of the Bible is this incredible epic love story. It really is a love story. And uh, when you read about the, the story of the Bible, it's almost too good to be true. And I like to think of uh, some of the great epic poems in history, like the Iliad and the Odyssey and some of the other great historical uh, myths that we find. We also find this incredible love story in the Bible of God's love for Israel and God's love for his people and God's so love the world. And it's, it's epic in every sense of the word. But the question is, it's epic, but is it true? Yes. And so what's, that's why in Epic Archaeology, we uh, want to follow all the lines of historical, apologetic, and archaeological evidence to show that the Bible is actually true and that Jesus really is who he said he was. Yeah, that, that, that's great. You know, I kind of look at it, you know, there's a couple of different ways you can look at the whole story of the Bible. You can start from the beginning, Genesis, and work your way through, right? You can, you can work your way through the story. But another way to look at it, though, is what you're emphasizing is the resurrection is the crowning jewel event, right? And it's kind yes. of it's kind of like you know dropping a boulder in a lake. It has you drop it in the lake. That's the resurrection, and it, and it, and it has a ripple effect in everything. So when you read the Bible, knowing the truth of the resurrection, it impacts the whole picture in a different kind of way. I think that's exactly yes. I totally agree, Henry, and you're absolutely right. And you know, in Jesus, uh, of course, as you and I believe, and and there's good historical and archaeological and you know from the from the biblical text there's good reasons to believe Jesus really did rise from the dead and when you have a man who rose from the dead who affirms people like Noah and people like Abraham then I'm going to go I'm going to I'm going to believe what he said so I think there's I think there is a connection between the resurrection and even some of the stories that we find in the Old Testament so because it is the crowning jewel of the Christian faith and um, so one of the things that when we when we do talks at Epic Archaeology you go to churches and, and colleges and different places to give talks one of the very our first questions that I ask people is, when you think about the stories in the Bible and really the crowning jewel, which is the, which is the resurrection, it's really a question about history, and and the, and so it brings up a really fundamental question: is how do we know the past? And uh, the the way I've been teaching this for several years is we know the past through primary sources, and uh, they're really basically three primary sources, and it's eyewitnesses historical records and archaeological evidence. Now, obviously, with the four Gospels, we have uh, we have eyewitnesses who claim to have seen Jesus rise from the dead, uh, but we can't interview them anymore. So the only thing we have left is the historical record in the Gospel. But then we also have archaeology, and so we can we can verify this these historical records with the archaeology. And the New Testament has got an incredible track record of being historically historically accurate. Uh, you know, recovering place names and the names of governors and government officials and uh, geographical places. There's just uh, literally hundreds of places and things that, that the New Testament records that have been discovered through archaeology. So if we can trust it with historical uh, sources, then we can also trust it with its uh, accurate recording of a man that rose from the dead. Now, obviously, this wouldn't happen if there was no God. So the way, and apologetically, that I handle uh, this issue of the resurrection is that uh, as a classically trained apologist, uh, one of the first things that I do is establish that God exists. And if God does exist, then miracles are possible. And the next question is, can we trust the New Testament? And the answer is an emphatic yes. We can absolutely trust the yeah. New Testament. It's and historically with, reliable. That's excellent, Ted. And with that word, we'll be right back after this break. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith, and I'm here with Ted Wright of Epic Archaeology. We're talking about how not only archaeology is epic, but what's really epic is the story of the Bible culminating in the gospel of Jesus. Now, uh, we're going to pick up where you left off there, Ted, a little bit. We're talking about archaeology and artifacts, and there's going to be some stuff we're going to talk about in our next few segments with you and, and into our next episode, because you're going to be here for two. 
But let's talk about, a little bit about uh, theology and philosophy as it relates to archaeology, because this is really important worldview and, and the different ways that people view the world or view the Bible influence the way they interpret things. So I'm going to let you get started with that. Absolutely. I, this really first uh, came on to my attention, onto my radar screen when I was uh, an undergrad student in archaeology. And uh, one of the courses that I had was uh, uh, Near Eastern Archaeology, which was just a basic course. And one of our textbooks was written by a very well-known Israeli archaeologist. And, and I know you know who this guy is, as Amon Ventor. And it's I think it's, the name of the book is The Archaeology of Ancient Israel. And at the very beginning of the book, uh, Ventor basically says, and I'm going to summarize paragraphs paraphrase essentially what he said is that he said it wouldn't really make a difference if um if you know g or if uh, abraham didn't exist or if noah didn't exist this this wouldn't really affect biblical faith you know because really the essence of the biblical stories is in their moral and uh, i don't want to raise my hand and go wait a minute yes it would actually make a difference if they actually happen you see that what it what he he doesn't realize ben tor and maybe he does maybe he doesn't i don't know i i don't know how to do psychoanalysis on him, but what he's doing is he's committing a philosophical fallacy of separating facts from values, and basically uh, his undergirding philosophy is that truth is actually a, a value, is something that sort of floats around and it uh, depends on who you are, it's relative to the person, whereas I would say that truth is that which corresponds to reality. Uh, this actually, uh, this whole bias is actually in the movie Indiana Jones, which he goes to the chalkboard and he writes yes. fact on the chalkboard and he says, "If you want truth, get on the hall to the philosophy class." But we're looking for facts in archaeology. And again, I want to raise my hand and go, "Wait a minute, Indy, you're a really cool archaeologist, but you're a poor philosopher." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's and because. Yeah. 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 That, well, that's right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. You no, know, it, it, it is a worldview that's kind of separating the two from each other is kind of like the facts are in this world over here. We actually have a had a previous program. We called it facts versus faith. And we discussed this whole thing in an episode of Digging for Truth because it's a philosophical belief. You can't prove that they they're arguing yep. that this is the way reality is constructed. And we're saying Reality is not constructed that way. First of all, the Bible tells us it's not. And second of all, that doesn't play out by real experience in the real world, does it? No, it doesn't. That's exactly right. And we don't we don't use that with uh, our doctor's appointments or any, we don't say, well, that's just how you feel about my diagnosis. We want to, we want our doctors to be right about what they're saying. Yeah. You know, if they find something wrong with us. Well, when it comes to religious questions, we sort of throw our mind out the door and we don't, uh, you know, it's it's all just a matter of opinion. And I, I just don't think that's the case at all. I think if if the laws of logic apply to reality, then they also apply to religious statements and statements in the, the Bible as well. And so um, I'm so grateful for uh, Associates for Biblical Research and what you guys are doing in, in connecting uh, the stories in the Bible and the, the faith that we have in Scripture with reality and with the with the archaeological uh, uh, record. Now, obviously, we haven't found everything, but the Bible has an incredible track track record of uh, being uh, to being reliable historically and archaeologically. Yeah, you know, it, it is interesting. We we've talked about we talk about that too. Of you know, you're not going to have evidence for every event that occurs. You know, especially you know, private conversations between two people, you know, David and Jonathan talking to each other or something like that. I mean, you're just not going to have evidence for that conversation. But what you have is uh, on the spectrum, you know, piece That's after right. piece after piece after piece. So after a while, it starts to say, OK, if the Bible is the word of God, then that's consistent with that claim. Historicity right. it doesn't prove it's the word of God, but it's consistent with the claim. Now, th this philosophy that we're talking about, uh, and I give you about a minute and a half to expand on this, Ted. Um, it really can influence the church too, I, and and un, uh, subconsciously, perhaps we might say. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. How how that can sort of get into the way that we think about the world and influence our trust in the scriptures. Absolutely, uh, Henry. You're exactly right. Years ago, I um, I was in seminary and I was uh, mentored and trained by uh, Dr. Norman Geisler, who many many Christians know his work and and he's just a uh, he's went to be with the Lord recently. But um, when I was his undergraduate, or actually, when actually when I was his graduate student, um, he was actually the president of the Evangelical Theological Society, and he wrote a paper called "Beware Philosophy: A Warning to Biblical Scholars." And in this paper, Dr. Geisler was uh, this basically um, giving a warning to to people who study the Bible to not be to watch out for 
aberrant philosophy and how it can sort of creep in under the radar with our study of the Scripture. And I think the same is true with the church. We don't realize that um, that there are that there's bad philosophy out there, and there there are really bad ways of thinking about the text. And this can come in through obviously uh, through evolutionary type thinking and uh, through uh, naturalistic type of theories that sort of creep in in our understanding of the text. And especially when we see this in uh, the more progressive movement in the church, where feeling is is emphasized, you know, and and experience is emphasized. And again, there's nothing wrong with feeling or experience, but at the end of the day, um, what what matters is what is true and what does the Bible say. So uh, I think that that comes into our comes into the church and influences us, and we got to be careful uh, to be not critical and not judgmental, but but we should be critical in our thinking and test everything as, as the scripture tells us. And of course, in the Old Testament, um, like be the, like the men of Issachar who knew the times and knew what to do. So we need to be discerning yes. in our understanding of the text and how we look at the text. And uh, the, because the Bible uh, seems to be very clear, but obviously uh, we need to understand it in its original cult- cultural context. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good word. So for us to have discernment is part of what you're saying, not only for the church layman, who are most of the people that watch our show are people that go to church, love the Lord. Uh, they don't do scholarship, but they're just as susceptible to bad philosophy creeping into the way that they think. And biblical scholars, Christian biblical scholars can fall into the same trap. And so it's Absolutely. a war- warning to us to have discernment. So, Ted, we're wrapping up this segment here and we're going to uh, have a s- short break, folks. Please don't go away. We'll be right back with Ted Wright from Epic Archaeology. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith, and I'm here today with Ted Wright of Epic Archaeology, and we're talking about the relationship between the Bible and archaeological evidence, a little bit of talk about philosophy, a little bit of talk about discernment as we study the Bible and we study these evidences outside the Bible. But Ted, so we're going to turn now our attention uh, to a little bit more specifics, because if we're going to talk about epic archaeology, we need to talk about discoveries and artifacts, because exactly. you know, <laughs> we, we, we're going to talk about philosophy. But let's, let's move towards that discussion. Uh, a favorite topic of many people, Egypt. And so yes. uh, now that's a big subject, but we're, let's move towards the historical exodus, because uh, there's a lot to say about that. We're going to do a little bit of an intro of that t- in this episode, and then we're going to talk about it more in part two. And we hope folks will come back for that. So go ahead and get started with that, please. Sounds good. You know, Henry, that is one. And you look at the Old Testament, the Exodus is really the most important salvific event in the Old Testament. And I used to teach Old Testament survey years ago in seminary and Bible college. And uh, one of the things that I would I would uh, teach my students is that if you really want to, because, you know, the Old Testament has got a lot of stuff in it. I mean, you've got Genesis all the way to Malachi, and there's all these stories and all these genealogies, and there's just a lot of stuff going on. And it, you can sort of get lost in all of the detail. But, but here's an easy way to really think about the Old Testament. Really, the most important part of the Old Testament is the Torah. It grounds the rest of the Old Testament. And in the Torah, in the first five books, the Exodus is the foundational event. It is the foundation of Israel. It's where God rescues Israel. In fact, Jesus is the Passover lamb. So all of the imagery of Jesus points back to the Old Testament. And then the rest of the Old Testament points back to the Exodus. So uh, when you look at the Old Testament, the Exodus is really a foundational event. And uh, the problem, Henry, today is that most uh, Old Testament scholars and most scholars today uh, completely discount it and that it never happened. It was just a story that was made up to sort of uh, give Israel some kind of uh, historical credence. 
Yeah, I, you're, you're emphasizing something I think intuitively church people would understand that if you read your New Testament in any kind of serious way, it, the theology of the Exodus is embedded in it. There's just no way to get away from that. Very deeply, yes. And, right. And then when you look at the old, it's, it's this constant theme. Remember what I did in Egypt. Remember what I did in Egypt. Yes. Remember what I did in Egypt. And if that didn't happen, what are they remembering? Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, right. so let's talk a little bit about, okay, so the events of the Exodus take place in the Egyptian Delta. So that's, yes. that's the northern part of, of Egypt, and, and it's in the east, so it's kind of going in the direction of the Sinai Peninsula. And so uh, talk a little bit about some of the archaeology that's uh, there, uh, the, the town that's been discovered, and let's, yes. let's give the folks a little bit of a taste of that. So as you know, Henry, and, and I know that uh, several of our colleagues uh, like Doug Petrovich and, of course, Scott Stripling and a lot of the guys at ABR as well, and I'm absolutely 100 percent in agreement that uh, the very likely uh, location where the Israelites were located in the Nile Delta is a place called Tel Aldaba, uh, also known as Avaris. And uh, it's also known as P. Ramses, which is where the Israelites would have been located. And the site has been excavated for years by an Austrian archaeologist by the name of Manfred Bittak. And uh, Manfred Bittak excavated there and discovered uh, a large presence, a presence of uh, Asiatics or non-Egyptians. And uh, as, uh, we haven't really talked about this yet, but one of the uh, uh, most important dates as well for the Exodus, as I believe the early date, which can be uh, referenced by 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, and then also the Jubilee cycles in Leviticus as well, and uh, some other things that really point to the early date, which would place the Exodus at about 1446 B.C., uh, sometime during the reign of Amenhotep II, uh, who, would, who would have been a pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. What's interesting also about Avaris or Tel Aldaba is its proximity to uh, Memphis, not Memphis, Tennessee, but Memphis, <laughs> Egypt uh, in the north, because uh, most of the pharaohs in the 18th dynasty had their royal residences in Thebes way, way far to the south, whereas uh, Amenhotep II had his royal residence in Memphis, which will actually would have been much closer to Tel Aldaba, which is where the Israelites would have been located. And there's incredible evidence that BTAC has discovered there. And I, and I know you guys have had shows on this before. No, no, that's all right. It, it bears repeating. It's so important, Ted. <laughs> so, so a couple of the things that you're talking about are things like the monumental palace structure that's been found there. You know, that's right. It looks like, hey, the pharaoh came out of the palace, and Moses uh, met him at the palace. The palace seems to be right next to the Nile. They find the palace next to a branch of the Nile River. That kind of thing. You know. That's right. Uh, it's sort of, uh, you know, it, fits, it doesn't say Pharaoh was here per se, but it it fits nicely with the biblical text, right? That's right. It's a, it's very, I, I believe it's very strong circumstantial evidence, which is really what archaeology is. Archaeology is a, is a forensic type of science. I mean, uh, it's a, it's a branch of history, and you know, unlike chemistry or biology, we can't go into a test tube and test whether or not Amenhotep II was there, but we build our case based on historical inferences and based on archaeology, and it all fits together very, very well. So, um, so I think that uh, when, we, when we look at this and we see that Avaris was abandoned uh, sometime during the Late Bronze Age, during, sometime during the reign of Amenhotep II, uh, it really seems to be the... Uh, in my view, the smoking gun that this is where the Israelites were located and this is where they left. Um, so I know that even among uh, archaeologists today, that's sort of a controversial interpretation. Maybe not, but uh, but certainly uh, it is a very good case that uh, that the Israelites very very likely were there. Yeah, I mean we've made that argument too, but it, it like I said, it, it does as does bear repeating. So Ted, we got about thirty seconds. We're going to wrap up this episode, and then we're going to have you back for part two. So we're, we're asking folks to uh, tune in for the next episode. Maybe you could do a quick 30-second wrap-up of what we talked about, and then we'll meet again. Absolutely. We're talking about the Exodus and uh, how important it is historically and archaeologically, how it really grounds the Old Testament, and then it grounds the New Testament. Because when you think about it, uh, Joshua was there, and, and when, uh, when the angel appeared to Mary, she said to call his name Yeshua, or Joshua, yes. which is really pointing back to the Exodus and the conquest. Yeah, yeah, there's a beautiful picture there of God's, God redeeming his people, and we see that 
quintessentially in the in the person of Christ. Uh, yes. Uh, Ted, thank you very much for being with us uh, for Digging for Truth. Uh, we're looking forward to having you back for part two. Thank you thank very you. much. It's my pleasure. Yes, excellent. Uh, friends, we do uh, invite you to come back for the next episode of Digging for Truth with Ted Wright from Epic Archaeology. And we hope you've enjoyed this episode and it will encourage you to trust the scriptures and the gospel of Jesus. Thank you for joining us today.